second installment of the East Hampton Historical Society's winter lecture series. We always plan it for the worst weather day of the month, so thank you for coming out. I'm Steve Long, Executive Director of the Historical Society, filling in for our series organizer and host, Barbara Borsak. Uh, she couldn't be with us this evening because she is in Savannah, which I had to check the temperature. At 5 o'clock today, it was 81 degrees. We miss you, Barbara. During this year's winter lecture series, we've been celebrating the centennial of the East Hampton Historical Society by looking at the histories of the museums and historic sites we interpret. This evening, we're featuring the East Hampton Town Marine Museum located on Bluff Road in Amagansett. And what I find so fascinating about this site is how contemporary discussions about what should the Marine Museum be, uh, what purpose should it play in our community. You look back 25, 50, 60 years ago, there are the exact same discussions and debates that were happening. Well, to help provide a bit of historical perspective on the Marine Museum, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Jacqueline Marks, who conducted a huge amount of her own primary research for this presentation. She's excited to share it with you. Jacqueline is a librarian and archivist at the Amagansett Library. Prior to joining the library, she was an archivist at the Sag Harbor Historical Society. She holds a certificate in rare books and manuscripts from the NYU School of Rare Books and has spent much of her career in the book publishing world. So please join me in welcoming Jacqueline. Good evening. Thank you so much. I'm so surprised to see anyone on such a terrible weather night. Um, I'm delighted that you're here and I, I think you might be able to help me. I'm very new to this history, and I have all these notes with me, um, so I, I hope you will humor me. I do love books very much, so I wanted to start uh, with a quote from Herman Melville from Moby Dick, and I also uh, have two lines of a poet, a poem by Grace Shulman, who maybe some of you know, and she read often at the Marine Museum days when it was used for poetry workshops and poetry readings. So uh, this is uh, Herman Melville. Nowhere in all of America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks, and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. We are also part of that New England coast that he's referring to. Whence came they? Melville asked in Moby Dick. He knew the answer. All these brave houses and flowery gardens come from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. One and all, they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. So I concur that everything we have here comes from the sea. And I'm going to talk tonight about a little bit about the history of the physical building itself leaning heavily on Bob Hefner's research. And then uh, Steve Long has asked me to open up the discussion to the idea of how the museum should function in this community today. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to show the museum as it exists now and hopefully uh, get a discussion going. This is, these are the two lines from Grace Shulman's poem. No more than geese in flight, shadowing the lawn, cries piercing wind, do we possess these fields, given the title, never the dominion. So I hope we'll remember that going forward. Um, there are many stakeholders in this museum, and no one has exclusive dominion. Before I start, I want to thank Jeannie Henderson for uh, going into the LTV archives and finding and editing clips for me, and Andrea Meyer, the doyenne of the Long Island collection, who sent me countless links, and Michael Heller, finally, for all his research in the archives of the East Hampton Star, and for all the photographs that he's given 
to this presentation tonight, which you will see. So I'm going to begin. A clip from the LTV archives of the museum director, Ralph Carpentier. If you don't know where you kind of came from, you're never going to be able to know where you're going. And I think there's a lot of that going on in our town. I think there's a lot of it going on in America because there has never been, because people really don't know the history of the community. Um, and that's what the kind of services that historical societies give to communities. They provide the history, a proper study of the history. That is a history that's not based on mythology. It's based on factual investigation of the community through the artifacts in the collection, through uh, other resources such as uh, archaeological investigations in a community. It tells us what the truth is of our relationships with the indigenous people that we found when we came here, uh, the ways in which we traded with one another and with the world at large, um, and the constant changing and, and interchange of the ways in which the social changes as well as the economic changes. We're still in a process of change. History is something that's happening every day. So a little bit about Ralph Carpentier. He not only painted the East End, he was an artist. Uh, he inhabited it fully, working as a commercial fisherman, a house painter. How do I click to the next Do I click, I just click? Or should I go to the next one? This is an oil painting by Mr. Carpentier. Um, so he did paint the East End. I think this was done of Laos Point in worked as a commercial fisherman at times. He was a house painter, a carpenter, and he was a teacher at East Hampton High School, the Hampton Day School, Southampton College, and the Art Barge on the Peak. He was deeply engaged in local affairs, and his opinions found frequent expressions in letters to the star. He was among the founders of the Town Marine Museum and oversaw the conversion of a former Navy barracks on Bluff Road in Amagansett for the museum in 1966. He created all its exhibits and its murals <coughs> until he stepped down in 1989 to put all of his energies into working on painting landscapes of the East End. The museum is truly a labor of love that I believe grew organically out of his vision and the vision of other people who were with him. Maybe some of you here tonight knew him. Um, I did not have the pleasure of knowing him, but he sounds like a, a wonderful, passionate human being. And I know that um, his wife, Hortense, also worked with him, and I do have a clip of the film they made together um, at the end of the presentation <laughs> called Beach Saners, which is an homage to uh, the Bay Men who made their living hall saining right off our beaches on. Atlantic Beach and Indian Wells Beach. This is a, a government map that speaks to Ralph Carpentier's point, which I very much support. It um, comes to me through archaeologist Allison McGovern, who we're lucky to have working right now on Long Island soil, finding more artifacts for us and more evidence our past history, especially the Native American history that existed here for thousands of years. So this map clearly shows the shape of Long Island and it's not lost on any of us that it, it sort of looks like a fish tail and it was named Palmonic to indicate that by the Montaukets who lived in Montauk. This is a simpler version of the map that comes from the frontispiece of uh, Jeanette Rattray's book, Whale Off, and I thought that I wanted to bring, I wanted to emphasize the point that we're just talking about East Hampton, if you can say, see the names, East Hampton e and East, East Hampton to Montauk, and there's so much history that happened in this little space that it's, I had really trouble 
choosing what to talk about tonight. So I'm starting with indigenous fishermen and whalers who are represented in the museum currently. However, we know much more now than we knew um, at the time of the founding of the museum in the 1960s and then the different renovations in the 1970s and I think another one in the 1990s. Um, there's much more archaeological work that's been done. We also have different, we have laser technologies. We have a lot of soil evaluation that um, is much more granulated than it was in the days that the museum was founded. So there's certainly a lot that can be done there. Um, I also, I wanted to share, which way am I going? This is uh, how, how connected all the different groups of Native Americans who uh, lived here were connected. Um, everybody basically traveled by canoe. There was a lot of competition. Um, the Shinnecocks and the Montaukets were allies, uh, and they did have enemies uh, across the way, across uh, the, the water there um, in New England. So Ninigret was not a friend. And there was a whole political scene going on here. They did not think of themselves as tribes. That was a, a nomenclature that came about from the missionaries and the white people who studied them and wrote it down as such. I, just to demonstrate how everything truly did come from the sea, when Lion Gardner and the other colonists landed here or were sent here from uh, Connecticut in the 1600s, the currency was wampum. The currency was wampum beads. And the colonists were very quick to readjust their economy to also trade in wampum. This is a drawing of how the beads were made. So what you're seeing here, it's, it's not the best drawing, but it's the only one I could find, is the pieces of the hollow beads that come from the purple part of what we call a clamshell, and they refer to as the quahog. It was the purple, the, that little purple part on the inside of the shell that was valued, and uh, they had drills. This drill is made of bone, and when the colonists came, they, st they saw the need for the drills, and they manufactured them in metal and uh, often traded them to the Native Americans for uh, mostly in land trades, land grabs. It would be part of the deal, um, which I'm sure you all know about. So that's the way the drill made the hole in the piece of shell. And then it, it was animal sinew that was used to string the wampum together. And on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the beginning of a belt um, so they often carried the wampum with them, either hanging from a uh, deerskin or around their waist um, to trade. Uh, of course, the first trading was done with trappers from Europe, um, not Englishmen, mostly Basques from Spain and Frenchmen who came to trap fur. They came for, for fur to the New World. Um, this is evidence of these, these are notched weights, and this is the addle addle that, that the um, Native Americans used. F at first to spear, it was a spear that you threw, so at first to spear big animals um, thousands and thousands of years ago, but the, the spear stayed a part of their culture, and so they made uh, spears also to spear whales that had drifted onto the beach. And this is in the um, this is in the Museum of the American Indian, and it's classified in their catalog as a harpoon head made from antler bone. Uh, and I have a description from Suffolk County Archaeological Society uh, describing. This is very up to date. This is the second edition uh, that just came out of the book about the history of the Montaukets. So this is pretty much the latest information we have about whale hunting. It wasn't deep sea whale hunting. They waited for drift whales to drift up onto the beach or come very close to the shore, and they were in canoes. The, the canoes used for whale hunting were not only the heavy tree trunk type, but ones of lighter weight. The bark of trees made the hull, 
and the bark was tied together with sinews and caulked with the fat of animals mixed with spruce gum. Right whales, the prize quarry, are the kind which swim along with their mouths open, sucking on food on the surface of the sea. The view into these enormous caverns better picture. <laughs> the view onto these enormous caverns uh, must have been frightening enough. In addition, a right whale has vast maneuverability with its tail. The tail can swing an arc from one side of the jaw to the other, seeking an, seeking an enemy before crashing down on it with a mighty blow. The creature the Indians hunted with stone and spears and bone harpoons. The technique was really to harry the whale to death. When a whale was sighted, all the canoes that could be manned set out in, in pursuit. If able, the Indians drove their harpoons into its hide. So this was not a very efficient way of killing the whale, but uh, many ceremonies, they did use the meat, much as the um, settlers who came after them used the meat. So by the time the whalers uh, uh, from England arrived here, the Indians already had experience with whales and they became very desirable mates on whaling ships, and they, they earned money and went out to sea. Um, they were conscripted by various whale ship owners who lived here. So that was one of the first uh, ways that Indians and settlers worked together, so to speak. But the Indian always got the short end of the stick. So this is actually in the Marine Museum today. This is a sketch of uh, the, a whale that's drifted on the beach. This shows you the, the 1907 beached whale um, that wound up in the Museum of Natural History on the upper left-hand corner. These are the blanket pieces when the whale has been, is truly dead and the men start to cut the body up. The head is cut up and the tail and fins are cut off separately. The Indians used the tail and the fins for ceremonial purposes to offer up uh, thank thankfulness and gratitude to the gods for sending them this plentiful food. And um, this is the cutting of the blubber on the bottom left. And the, the tripods, they call them Bible leaves. They have to render the, the meat into fat, and they have to cut it into smaller pieces in order to, to uh, be able to boil it in the tripod. This painting is actually in the museum today. It's by Klaus Hoey. You'll, you'll see some more of his work later on in the uh, presentation. And this is deep sea whaling. This is his version of uh, a ship, and they actually put the platform on the side of the boat so, and there's, the whale is in the water. I don't know if you, you can see the shadow of the whale. And they're um, harpooning him, and they're, they're starting to cut the meat. Um, he, and the, part of the reason the whales are called the right whale is because they brought a great fortune to East Hampton and to Sag Harbor and to Southampton and to Shinnecock. They were the right whale because of their monetary value, but they were also the right whale because after they're dead, they float on the surface for long enough um, for them to be rendered and cut into pieces, whereas the other whales are sink to the bottom. Part of the reason for that is because they have baleen in their mouths, with, which is, they're not teeth, they're, they're sort of like curtains that, um, that Sieve, they're like a sieve that, that allows the small creatures to come in that the whale feeds on, and they, that's what was later used as whalebone. That's what we call whalebone. Um, and it was used for corsets and umbrellas and many other things that most of you are familiar with. So uh, Klaus Hoey takes his inspiration for paintings from the sea, and he often uses whaling logs and uh, this was, I believe, the whaling log of uh, Jonathan, Captain Jonathan C. Edwards. And, and it's written in the 1880s. And it's called Harvesting the Blubber. The blubber. So this is a quote from the whaling log. Once killed, the whale is pulled to the ship and tied along her side. The whale can stay afloat for a long time, but sharks 
start tearing at the flesh almost instantly. The harvesting must begin because the blubber spoils fast in the hot sun. The log record started cutting at six o'clock, finished at 10, stood greater watches. We'll call all hands at four to start the works to com commence boiling on the morrow. So ends these 24 hours. Uh, that's his neat bloodless rendering of it. Um, this is the um, tri, tri works that were located on Atlantic Beach, and we'll see. We'll learn more about them uh, in a minute. So these are these. This little building was actually on Atlantic Beach, and these are member. These are the men who were there trying um, the blubber after the after the whale had been caught this was an the whole town was involved in this women children uh, they let children out of school when a whale was sighted almost every maybe some of you have houses with a little trap door in the attic where um, they would raise the weft um, there was a west side team and an east side team so the west side team with the, the Edwards and all the Edwards brothers and the Edwards children and um, they had a white a white flag and they would raise the flag and that way everybody in the town would see it and come running down to the beach to help including the women who brought food um, for the men and the children it was a big event in the town and people shared the the meat um, and it could go on for hours and hours and there was uh, an, an east end no that was the east end crew there was a west end crew and their home was in the home of george smith and his Great granddaughter lives in Springs today and often comes to talk to me. And that flag was an American flag, and those whalers were not as experienced. But um, she's very proud because she's the great granddaughter of one of the boat steerers, which was a very important part of um, the whaling. And then there were the Dominies, um, who who were also, as you know, the builders of our windmills and our clocks and our furniture, but they also took part in the whale hunt. Um, it was a communal effort on the East End. Um, now you'll be treated to about two minutes of um, Bayman Milton Miller, um, who's talking about Atlantic Beach. Oh, this is the uh, first place we're standing at the and uh, at Vine Avenue in Amagansett, uh, around New York. And this is uh, one of the very important places when I was a boy growing up in, for the economy of the East Ham town. Uh, uh, this area here was goes back to the days of the whaling days. And at the, that time, they were still whaling uh, houses here where they housed their whale boats and all the whaling equipment was still in them. And right over here to my uh, right or uh, left here is uh, where uh, one big whaling boat was. And they, most of this was uh, the days in that time uh, Captain Josh Edwards and Captain uh, Clint Edwards uh, Captain Gabe Edwards and uh, a lot of the captains that used to be uh, whaling captains and they worked off of this beach. Uh, whaling uh, was, uh, you know, they had got kind of old, but whaling had given out and uh, there weren't no more whaling, but they, they still carried on uh, gilling that fishing off the ocean beach here. Uh, they. Uh, he used to gill net and haul thing here. And I just, uh, I was born only a couple thousand feet in back of these dunes. And it's a, this was a very important place, in the, especially in the winter months. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of fishing carried on here, and there was a lot of the townspeople was involved in it. But most of the whaling, all the whaling had given up when I was a boy, but the, the old whalers were still around, you know, they still carried on different types of fishing, haul sand and uh, gill net and so forth in the ocean. So uh, this is uh, on, uh, I think the picture's reversed, so I think on, on your right 
is uh, Captain Captain Joshua Edwards, who Milton was just talking about, and on the on your left is the uh, his uncle, Uncle Jonathan C. Edwards, and I believe that's the uh, whaling log that Klaus Hoey's uh, painting was based on. So I mean, these these men did shore whaling after they were married, but as young men, um, they shipped out to sea. They, they had a lot of experience uh, with whales. So on the left side, you see um, Captain Josh Edwards, who you just saw with a gray beard, uh, as a 20-year-old when he first shipped out. And later, he got married soon after that, and he decided not to go on any more whaling voyages. He decided to stay home with his wife. Um, there are a lot of legends about him. One of them is that uh, on his honeymoon, he rented a carriage and they were going to go to Montauk for their honeymoon. And the carriage overturned because our roads out here were, were awful. They were just dirt roads, nothing was paved. And he broke both his legs on his honeymoon. And it took a long time to heal, but he got back um, and he was still on crutches and there was a whale sighted and he went out on the boat. There was nothing that could keep him back. This is the youngest of that generation. This is the, on the, on your right is Gabe Edwards, uh, Captain Gabe Edwards, and he was the, the youngest brother. He just caught the, the very end of the big whaling days. He was also an experienced whaler. And the story about him I've heard many times. I spoke just by coincidence to his great, great granddaughter um, who called up because she had a, an Edwards Bible and she wanted some advice about who to take it to, to conserve it and refurbish it. And, and as a result, we got into this great discussion. And um, he, he, but every, this is in, uh, you can listen to the audio tapes that there are great folklore tapes from the 1980s. And he's the subject of one of the tapes. And, the story is told and retold. He went to his grave believing that he had seen a mermaid. He was knocked unconscious on a whale hunt. He was thrown overboard and hit over the head, and they were going to leave him for dead, but they managed you know, to, to get him back into the whale boat. And um, he was unconscious in his house for three days. And when he came to, he, he swore that he saw a mermaid. And so his, his granddaughter, and his great-grandchildren grew up having a um, Christmas tree with just mermaid ornaments, which I've actually been privileged to see a picture of, which was quite wonderful. And the great-granddaughter still has that. Um, and she remembers when her mother did that. So they're um, beloved characters in our history. This is a model that Captain Josh Edwards made of the whale ship Ontario. That's the first whale he shipped out on in his youth. This is a great picture from the Dayton Photo Archives that shows the turn of the century uh, whaling where there were still wagons used to get the boats in the water and an onlooker from the, from the summer colony who's well dressed and it speaks to the diversity of the population and also the coexistence of great wealth and um, real hard working fishermen. Um, unfortunately, this is really small and um, it's not one of Doug Kunz's beautiful photos, which I'll talk about later. It's a photo that was uh, belonged to Rick Whalen and Stuart Volper. It was, a f it was in their family. Um, and it's used by Avril Geis in her beautiful book, From, From Sea to Shining Sea. They are, they are fishing with a net. Um, they, here they're actually getting squid, which was interesting to me. I didn't know this was an area for getting squid. Um, oh, this is uh, the boat, the boat um, club which became the Yachting Club for Devon Colony, which it looks much the same today. It might look familiar to you. And the reason I included this slide was because this was built in 1909. So in 1907, people were still willing. People were willing in this area, in Wainscott, to Montauk, not Montauk, but to Nepeague, um, 
t until 1918, there was still once in a while a whale sighted. Um, I think, I think the last time anybody went out was in 1918, and they didn't succeed. They didn't bring the whale home. Um, they were also much older by then. But I, I wanted to point out that people have used the water and the sea from from the very elite to real working class people, um, and in this case. The Devon Colony was built by uh, robber barons, basically, from Cincinnati. They were big oil tycoons. Uh, there was the president of Procter & Gamble among them. And we owe them a lot. I mean, they built up the area a lot. But they wanted this yacht club because they had come here to hunt. They had come here to hunt um, as for leisure. They came from Cincinnati, and they found Montauk. And then they got married, and they wanted to bring their wives and children out here, and they were worried that there would be nothing for their wives and children to do while they were out hunting. And so they liked yachting, and they, at the same time that people were still whaling and doing hull saning, they, um, they built themselves a concrete factory so they could lay foundations for their, for their homes and, and for this uh, club. And then they demolished it when they were finished, and they had custom-built yachts made in England and Italy for themselves. And so all this was going on here at the same time, which I think will help us uh, going forward planning the museum, that there's so many different populations living in different realities here. And we'll have to accommodate all that, all that vision. Um, so now we're jumping ahead. And it's 1939. And um, this is Napeak. This is an advertisement for Beach Hampton in Amagansett. And this was part of a brochure that for between $1,750 and $2,000, you could buy a house here and you could live near the sea. The sea is always the sales pitch. Uh, and here's the advertising brochure. And if you can see it, this, in 1941, this is this was the view. Well, this this is advertisement for Beach Hampton. This was in 1937. The Cape Cod depicted is the Nantucket model. From R. B. Allen was the developer, and he wanted people to see how peaceful and wonderful it was out here. It still was very peaceful in 1937. Their population was about 6,000, and this is the architect of Beach Hampton houses. So now. Um, I have two things to say about the museum, and then I'll tell you about the history of the building. So in 1932, a, a little bit prior to the Beach Hampton homes being built and sold, uh, the, uh, someone came to speak at the Historical Society here. It might, I don't know if it was the, the East Hampton Historical Society, or I think it was the Suffolk County Historical Society. He came from Nantucket, a Mr. Macy, and he suggested that uh, this area should have its own whaling museum. And people became excited about that here, and I guess they remembered it. And in 1936, Jeanette Rattray and her family, Jeanette Edwards Rattray, wanted to donate uh, artifacts that had belonged to her grandfather and uh, the, the other Edwards captains, and there was no place to house them. So Amagansett Village Improvement Society, which was founded in the 1920s and was active in every cultural aspect of Amagansett, um, took this to heart and wanted to have a whaling museum. And someone offered up uh, uh, one of the Mulford houses, and I don't know exactly which one. And we have to remember we're in the Depression now. Um, so this was quite a privileged community for people to be thinking about um, creating a museum. So uh, at the same time, the Bay men were really struggling. They were having a hard time making a living. And um, people had to sell off land. Even the town of East Hampton had to sell off land. Uh, and this is a quote from Mil Miller, who you just heard. Times was so hard that what I'd done was row at night from Bonnet Creek across to Gardner's and around to the East Shore and sneak across the beach into Great Pond when there was no moon and scratch up maybe four bushel of clams, 
then lugged them four bushel back over the beach out to my Sharpie, which was the little boat, and I couldn't afford them nice wire baskets. I used wood produce baskets with sharp wire handles, nearly cut my hands off. Then I'd row all the way back, and a couple of times I damn near swamped, coming around out of the lee at Cartwright Shoal, and I was, when I was done, I got 50 cents a bushel for them clams and was glad to have it. I had kids crying at home, and I had no choice. So it's, um, it's, it's uh, much the same as it, 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 as it is today in many ways, all the different parts of the community, and people managed to make it here. So now we're in 19, 1942, 1939, um, 1936, Franklin Roosevelt is re-elected President of the United States. On January 15th, 1936, uh, two, two boats are, that make the newspaper, two ships are torpedoed off the coast of Montauk. One, one directly off the coast of Montauk called the Cumbra, and uh, people were, Southampton Hospital was ready to take uh, the injured. And the other one was off the coast, closer to Nantucket, but also within the scope of the Montauk Light. So the United States is still declaring neutrality. Uh, by 1939, Roosevelt knew, he, he was, you know, in talking all the time to Winston Churchill, and he knew that neutrality wasn't the best policy, but the American public was all for isolationism. So um, we, we are still not officially in the war, but we do have a very active Coast Guard. The Life Saving Service has now become the Coast Guard, and now the, the war is on our shores, quite literally, um, right here. Uh, this picture got a little bit pixelated, but I wanted to talk about the Marines. So just a little background. This is the uh, Allied Operations Room. Um, where they're tracking submarines, many of which came very close to Long Island waters. Uh, and we're still not in the war at this point. Um, here's, a, here's just to give you a sense of what's going on. So Britain is the only ally really still actively um, unoccupied, but they're getting bombed. So their only way to survive is uh, to get supplies from the merchant convoys. And the United States was neutral, but they were quietly uh, defending the merchant convoys. They were defending the ships that were bringing goods to England. And Mil Miller was on one such ship, and he just says something like, you know, well, none of the, nobody in America knew that we were in the war, but we were in the war. Uh, it was just kept very quiet. Uh, and here you see tor uh, a ship being torpedoed, and on the lower right you see a U-boat um, being attacked, and these are depth charges going off on, on the right. This was a serious war. So this is a, an overview taken a little bit after World War II of Atlantic Avenue and Bluff Road, and you see the life-saving stationed right in the front of the picture. And a little bit behind that, you see the guardhouse, that little tiny structure is the guardhouse. And on the, on the very right on Bluff Road is uh, the headquarters for naval personnel who were stationed here, married men with children, or without children, but married men. And then can you make out the, the brick building? I don't, does, can you see my pointer? Sorry, I didn't know you could. So um, this is the brick building. So this would be the Donald Lamb building, um, which was the low frequency transmitter building for this compound. The Navy kind of took, you know, s quietly took this over all these buildings. And um, this was the low frequency t transmitter station for the, the Coast Guard and all these little buildings where there were uh, radio frequency detection works going on, and, the, and also, of course, the Coast Guard. It was now the Coast Guard. They also did their usual thing, looking out for boats and enemy, enemies and submarines, and they also patrolled the shore at night by foot, um, walking five miles in each direction. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute all the other um, 
life, life stations that were near us. Um, this is the Marine Museum from the back. Uh, this is the back view, and um, it, looks, it looks much the same as today. That served as a naval barracks for the single men, and this path that you can't see the building at the end of this path, but you can just make out this kind of boardwalk-like path um, that went down to a secret high-frequency radio trend operating station that was behind the dunes hidden on the beach that um, was, was manned by 30 naval men at a time, 30 operators, and they had 24-hour ships shifts, and they were listening for uh, signals from the U-boats um, that were in American territory in the Atlantic. And there were four other stations along the this coast, along our coast. Um, one was in Winter Harbor, Maine. The, the Ours was in Amagansett. There was one in Cheltenham, Maryland. And there was one in Jupiter, Florida. And what would happen was would all these signals were triangulated and the vectors um, could be, would, were sent, it was sent to Washington, the information was sent to Washington, and from, from Washington it went to the Pentagon and it was, uh, it, they were working on decoding um, the signals of the U-boats. Uh, U-boat, by the way, just stands for Unter Seaboat, which means under the sea boat. So this is the way East Hampton Marine Museum looks today. You can clearly see it was a barracks. Um, now it becomes very apparent once you know. And so this is, this is the side where the men could come out. There was no circular driveway at the time. It was a parade ground. It was just a lawn. Uh, this is the back of the um, building. This is the side view. And this was this is uh, this is important to note because um, here's here again we see the side view because when they went out uh, in the in 1942 when they were in service here this is where the boardwalk was and they would secretly go from from the the dormitory to uh, the secret high definition radio frequency finding station which you can see is right on the beach. And um, that, that was going on 24 hours a day without, without anybody here really uh, knowing about it. So uh, this is a little bit more information about that. These are the architectural drawings where you can clearly see the design, uh, this side view. And this I thought was really interesting when we get inside the museum later because this is the second floor, and all of you who, who've been to the museum are familiar with the exhibit space there, um, the photographs that are hanging, and the little nooks where there are different uh, conservation-minded uh, exhibits. So this clearly shows you how the men slept. The washrooms were up there. Um, they were sleeping uh, upstairs, just you know, one bed facing the other. So there's definitely room for at least 30 men. Um, and then these are the different floor plans. So I think you can see it better than I can. And the, the downstairs was the rec room and storage space and the mess hall. So it's good, nice to remember next time you're in the Marine Museum, just the incredible work that was done to turn that space into a museum. This was sent to me uh, by the good graces of David Lease. Um, who cares about everything here um, and is just the most wonderful, um, enthusiastic supporter of history. Uh, this, this also helps us now when you're driving on Bluff Road. This was a government, this was drawn for the government. So they saw uh, what we think of as the Donald Lamb Building and the Marine Museum and um, the Life Saving Station and they, and they saw, and the dunes, they saw that all as a, a military compound for a time, and they considered it all uh, one area. So now we come to the Donald W. Lamb Building, which was the low frequency finding station. Uh, it was built for that purpose. And the, the brick, you can read it yourselves, the brick portion was constructed in about 1939. It was the transmitter building for the Naval Low Frequency Direction Finding Station. And the transmitters are still on the wall today, if you look. Um, so 
it was a government compound for a long time. And interestingly enough, when you walk inside today, this was the outer wall. That's why, why it's brick. And they decided to save the high frequency secret uh, radio finding station. And they literally attached it to, they moved it up from the dunes. They, there's no longer a boardwalk. Um, and they attached it to the Donald Lamb building, which is why the Donald Lamb building looks the way it does. <laughs> Um, and this is this is the view from the bottom where I'm sure you've all been and uh, it's the Dari rescue squads home away from home and I, I'm not going to talk about the life-saving station but just to reiterate that the naval men were not alone the Coast Guard played a big part and th this is this is just Long Island and these are this is the location of all the um, other Coast Guard stations life, they, who, that were originally life-saving service. So they all, they all took part in this war effort. Um, and there was a lot of support for the Navy. Um, this is, these are the interior spaces today, which I won't talk about too much. Um, this is a, an ad that Michael Heller found that was placed in the East Hampton Star by Ralph Carpentier. Um, which is kind of sweet. Uh, we may be doing something like that again, maybe. <laughs> um, artists, craftsmen, morning, noon, night, you name it, on deadline assignment to complete new town marine museum in time for opening in June. Model makers, whittlers, painters, etc. Salary consists of psychic satisfaction, seeing your work in a great setting, meeting other talented benevolence of the area. Call Ralph. So I guess now you would email. <laughs> um, but. Um, so this is this is largely, um, and those of you who know him, I hope you'll you'll talk about him later. I wish I had known him, but um, this diorama um, is his idea, and someone else uh, helped him construct it. However, um, he did go to Montauk and he talked with the old timers. He wanted this to be accurate. As you know, they built their own. The Montauk fishing village sprang up out of the baymen's need to fish year round. And it was it was better, they fished some of the time at home in Amagansett, East Hampton, and then they would move themselves to Montauk when the fish were there in the bay, and it was a lot easier because it wasn't ocean fishing necessarily. And they built their own houses, a lot of times um, made out of the boxes, the white pine wood that were used to ship fish to Fulton Fish Market in. Um, and so this is when you walk into the museum. Uh, this is this is at the time uh, what what we knew about indigenous life here. Uh, now we know a lot more, and this is this we might change this today. But this was a, a nod to the heritage of the indigenous people. Um, this is how it looks now. So I'll, I'll run through these, so I don't want to take up a lot of time. Uh, Ralph Carpentier gave not only his sweat to this and his, his vision, but he also gave uh, his illustrations. All three of these are by him, and they're all hanging in the, um, in the museum today. And that's a, it's a great Halsane net picture. The Halsane nets were often, of this type, were often 1,000 feet long. Um, this is... Uh, more, just more exhibits. Um, you can see the stairwell there, which now you know is going up to the dormitory. Um, and part of the part of what was interesting to read about the renovations was that there were many washrooms because there were many young men living there. Um, you know, and they had to reconfigure all that space. So here you see how they they opened it up, and this, this is the Bayman's year, which is very important to understand because. Um, they fished everywhere. Um, they didn't just fish, you know, you didn't just dig for clams. You also might go out for lobsters. You might do bunker fishing. You might do hull sand fishing. You had to make a living year round. Uh, unlike the farmers who could farm and then just fish during the winter when they weren't farming. Um, this is the HMS Culloden. And uh, I won't I won't talk about it, but it was a, a big coup for the museum, I think, to get this, and a lot of effort went into preserving it. It was it comes from the 1781, uh, His Majesty's boat that during the revolutionary well after the Revolutionary War, which which is uh, 
a big thing for a museum to have. I'm not sure about that the wrecks, that shipwrecks and ship artifacts were in the first vision for the, the original uh, vision for the museum. So, and this I'm, I don't really understand. I thought maybe somebody here would enlighten me. Um, apparently they moved this Indian field gunning shack uh, from Montauk where it originally was and, and they thought it would be a good place to have it at the Marine Museum. And I, oh, I'm, I'm just thinking maybe because of the duck decoy carving, but I'm not sure um, why this, why it was felt this was the appropriate place. Um, this is the upstairs gallery with more pictures, and then this is the gallery of uh, Klaus Hoey's paintings as it looks today. And, and this I thought you might find interesting. Um, it was the museum logo type that it was designed as the original logo for the museum. I didn't see it used anywhere. I didn't find much publicity. I found one very um, homegrown sort of sheet that was handed out to visitors, which I will, I will share with Steve afterwards, and which I have um, on my computer. I'm not sure I have a picture here, but I don't know if it was ever used. So that's that's the logo. Um, this was the handout I found, which is which is great to read because it gives the you know, it gives the philosophy and it, it gives everything that um, was put into this. It also emphasizes the photographs, which I don't have. I but I brought the book for anybody who would like to see the photographs of um, that grew out of Peter Matheson's wonderful book, uh, Men's Lives. That was funded by Adelaide de Manil. She made the dream come true for a lot of people. She made a dream come true for the Bay Men um, and for Doug Koontz, who wanted to photograph them, and for Peter Matheson, who worked among them and loved them and wrote a beautiful book um, as a witness, as a testimony to the lives of the Bay Men, which, which I do think the museum is. Um, which is part of why there's so much passion about it. It's uh, it's bearing witness, um, which is another function of museums, if you will. Um, and this is this we've seen, we've seen this picture unfortunately lately in the news, but it was a very important whaling dory that belonged to the King family, and uh, Dan King, I believe, and his wife actually before they left. Um, in two thousand four, I think she wrote uh, a book, a, a fiction book, um, to raise funds for the Marine Museum, and she was very successful with it. She sold, I think, thousands of copies. And um, but they moved to North Carolina um, because, unfortunately, they couldn't afford to stay here. So I've included bunker fishing at Promised Land because it was included in the Bayman Association's newsletter, and because. Most, if not all, of the baymen fished at some time um, at Promised Land. They fished off the boats in Promised Land if they didn't have their own boat. And that was, once again, to make ends meet, especially after the striped bass um, were off limits for them. And the, the DEC had, uh, in 1992, I believe, uh, made the, the striped bass ocean fishing outlawed, and they had made the measurement in New York, just in New York State, um, really prohibitive for people who earned most of their money selling pro, uh, striped bass. So they were supplementing their income all the time, often working for on bunker, bunker boats from Promised Land. And these are the three bunker boats that belong to the Edwards family. So these were the, the boats that baymen here worked on, um, so I thought it was relevant for us to see them. They were uh, steam operated by now. Um, this was their newsletter uh, in 1977 of August. The Bayman wrote in their newsletter mourning the loss of um, Thomas Land, which closed in 1968. The Smith Meal Company was the last of the working bunker fisheries here in our, in our neck of the woods. And they took a photograph on the bottom, which unfortunately is cut off in this slide, but it was uh, the remaining houses where the um, men who came up from North Carolina and South Carolina, um, heavily uh, people of color, um, who, ca who counted on coming up to Long Island every summer um, to do bunker fishing. And they lost their livelihood when the, when the Smith Meal Company moved to New Jersey. 
and there's no more bunker fishing um, in Long Island, and th they're questioning in this 1977 newsletter, you know, what's going to happen to the structures? Is East Hampton Town going to do anything about it? And apparently we never did, because if you walk there today, um, you just see remnants of old buildings, but I don't, and I, I think it, the land is preserved now. So uh, the other, this East Hampton Town commercial dock was a huge part of Ralph Car Carpentier's original v vision for um, the museum. His original vision included boat building classes, which he worked very hard along with Pat Mundus to institute as part of the ongoing programming at the museum. Um, he had a lot of trouble finding someone. I spoke on the phone to uh, someone who no longer lives here by the name of John Ritter, and he was the first person. He was the first person full, fully employed and paid by the town of East Hampton to work for the Historical Society as a teacher for uh, boat building and, uh, and sailing. And uh, he only lasted a year. And then they, they eventually, through Ralph Carpentier's uh, personal connections, they found someone named Recep Jordania. Maybe some of you knew him, too. He was actually a philosopher professor from Harvard. And he gave up his tenure uh, to move out here. He was in love with it. He was loving, in love with boat building. And I think he was here for 10 years. And uh, he, these, are, these are from his, uh, the era of Recep uh, Jordania. Um, these, w these were in the East Hampton Star um, as bright, bright lights. Um, and this, was all, this all took place at the boat shop on Three Mile Harbor. Um, and it looked, it had the same footprint as it has today, the smaller building on the side of the Harbor Master's house. Uh, and it lost its title um, when they decided that the Marine Patrol needed the space. And so the commercial dock still existed for the baymen and fishermen to use, but it was no longer available to the boat for the boat building classes for the museum. And that was that was a huge loss. So here here I just wanted to um, Michael took this picture um, to show you the proximity to the water because there was a controversy that arose. Um, this that's the smaller building on the side that was act where they actually did the boat building, and you can see it's right up against the water. So once they had built a boat, they were able to launch it. Um, and and now comes the East Hampton. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Sorry. East Hampton Classic Boat Building Society. So there was a bit of a brouhaha when uh, funds were first raised for this by by largely by Ray Harden um, and his contacts in the architectural world. Uh, because they didn't want to lose the aspect of the shipbuilding, uh, boat building, and the model making, um, and offering it to young people as as a skill, a craft, and possibly a trade, and so uh, they were so sorry to lose it. And one of the objections they objected to selling land from that belonged to the, with the Marine Museum. They objected because uh, it wasn't close enough to the water to launch a boat. But anyway, Ray Hardin won out, and now we have this beautiful classic boat building shop. For those of you who are never there, it's it's worth it's worth taking a look. All the architecture was donated um, for free by by Lewis Mackle, I think, uh, out of love. And this is uh, I I wish Ray was here tonight, but um, anyway, this is named also for him. And I I just wanted to close with. Um, uh, just a few minutes of the Hall Saining film that was made by Ralph Car Carpentier and his wife. It has a bit of an odd um, soundtrack, so cover your ears. <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's kind of precious. It was it's from 1962. Right fast, right fast in the back. The 
that each grew no time of happiness can compare with. No creature is more beautiful to it. Listening, powerful, smart, clean, respected. Like all good hunters, the beach singers love the worthy prey. sand and sweat in their eyes, but the crew picks fish with exuberance. They waited a long time for this productive haul. To each man, it means a different thing. Mortgage payment, doctor bills for a pregnant wife, a new truck tire, an engagement ring. But those things will come later. He must load all this net. Bag is loaded amidships. Now the west arm of the same must be loaded. in the truck. The air is crisp and clear. The surf has dropped down since daybreak. Life is sweet. Well, yeah, boys, what do you think? We go home, pack these fish out, have breakfast, come back, or we'll take a look to east and see if we see a bunch of fish. What's the difference what we think, Ted? We'll make another set of go home, as you call it. And that's the kind of democracy that prevails with a beach same crew. Captain Ted Lester always asks the boys first before he decides what they will do next. And finally, that's the way it should be. It's an unquestioned tradition. As the rig moves eastward along the beach, the youngest member of the crew thinks about his girl and 
looks for signs of fish. The day will come when he will decide the actions of the crew on this beach. He doesn't think about it much, but it's part of him. It's all part of a long tradition. Well, I, I know we're over time, so thank you all for coming this evening. We'll be back here on March 25th when David Cataletto is uh, scheduled to speak about Clinton Academy. So uh, I, I really, you know, Jacqueline and Michael did a tremendous amount of research. Jacqueline, what a great presentation. You, she said, oh, I've never done this before, she told me earlier. Well, it certainly didn't look like that, and I think she did an amazing job, and all of us, I feel like, learned so much.